Welcome back, everybody. We're discussing Helping Hands Against Violence, their organization, and want to talk a little bit about statistics and just some of the uh, services that have been offered. And I understand you have some of those numbers. Right. So let's um, let's let's just start off with how many victims or survivors, I should say, have you guys been able to assist? Last year, we, we do it annually, we do our statistics annually, and that's a really important thing for the grants that we write for. Uh, last year, we served about 2,500 nights of stay in our chrysalis house. 2,500 nights, mm -hmm. okay. So do you know what that is? is that that doesn't break down to necessarily survivors. It doesn't. Okay. A night of stay to us, as far as our statistical analysis goes, is um, a person staying the night, and that count is for children as well as women. Okay, okay. How about um, your your, your follow-up services? Because you spoke about how important that is, and I would assume, yeah, it would be, so. It is important because People that come to and need our services, really, they have so much that they still have to get done. So we offered about 7,300 follow-up services last year, and that means that we're checking up on the client once they've left our facility, or we're helping them um, seek services through DHS, or if they need food stamps, or if they need housing. You know, a lot of times these women, they flee, and they have nothing but the clothes on their back. And so they often need, you know, help getting their children into schools. They need help with um, the court system. Maybe they need a stock. They need to do a stocking order. Maybe they need to do some kind of uh, parenting plan option with the courts. So we offer those kinds of services, and that's what would count into that 7,300 number. Okay. With those follow-up services, how are those facilitated? If they're maybe still within reach of their abuser, and their abuser might find out. Do you have to be pretty dis discreet about that, or, or how do you go about those follow-up services? In the perfect world, uh, the survivors left our agency and they are no longer with their abuser and they're in a healthy place. Okay. So that's, that's the perfect world. That isn't always the case. Um, we definitely, we have some fail-safes. They can't, ha you know, their abuser can't know where we're at and um, we definitely encourage them to not go back to their abusers. So when we offer those follow-up services, they're in a safe place. Legal assistance, because you mentioned they might have to um, have a, a stocking order mm -hmm. in place and helping them with that. So you guys even help with the legal aspect of all of this. We do, and we partner with, like in the courthouse in Hood River, we work with the victim's advocate um, one specific person and so we would on behalf of our client we would advocate for them with um, with the court system so those things are things as, such as stocking orders um, if they need to get custody of their children sometimes they don't have custody of their children and any any legal help that they might need we work with the court systems to get them the right help even if it was a divorce situation? Even if it's a divorce situation. All right, so you can help them mm -hmm. get that squared away. That's great. Mm -hmm. What about um, the victims that actually end up in the hospital? You guys have had to devote a significant amount of time to that too. We do. An advocate is assigned to a client and then the advocate will help them with whatever the needs that they have are. So if they, um, if they actually physically are in the hospital or they need to be transported to doctor's appointments, that's an advocate's role would be to assist them in that. And hopefully if they are in the hospital, the next step would be to come to the shelter right. afterwards. But the advocate will transport them to whatever subsequent doctor's appointments that they need. Obviously, all of these things cost money, and you guys get your funding primarily from grants. Is seventy percent of 70%? our budget? Okay. Seventy percent of our budget, and then the th the other thirty percent is primarily done through appeal letters, private donations, and income development. We do a lot of fundraising. We have about two major fundraisers a year, and our fall fundraiser is actually coming up. It's going to be on October twenty third at the Pines. It's a silent auction with a live auctioneer and some really great things that local folks have donated. So I definitely encourage folks to come to that. Absolutely. It's a fairly inexpensive night out. There will be music and uh, doors open at 6 o'clock. Okay. So certainly encourage folks to come out to that. And then we also do, um, you know, we do one major spring event. And then we have a lot of smaller events at local wineries and breweries. They support us 
a great deal, and oftentimes it's live music um, at these events. And then there was one, a couple of our board members did a big barbecue, and that raised about $1,000. We've done garage sales. So we do a lot of things that are, um, are ways for the community to help. Um, we definitely encourage volunteers to come and help during those fundraising events. At least come and show up and have a great time. Uh, you can always, folks can look on our website, which is helpinghandsoregon.com. Um, to Oregon see spelled out? Oregon spelled out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's always got a list of what's up and coming. And other ways that folks can get involved is they can just offer to volunteer. Um, they can call our hotline, which is 541-386-6603 okay. to, um, to be connected to the person that can help them out, our fundraising and volunteer coordinator. And um, we definitely, we look for material donations as well. Um, like I said, a lot of times our clients have nothing. So when they're moving into a new place, they need, they need toilet paper, they need beds, they need chairs, cups. So we do take a lot of private donations for um, our clients in that way. And then we work with a lot of um, the local uh, secondhand stores so that when we receive donations that we can't use at that time, we donate them to them. And then when our clients need something, they have vouchers that they can go and utilize at those local secondhand stores. Great. Yeah. So Helping Hands Against Violence is a 501c3 then? It is. It is. Okay, so for folks that maybe had the means to make a sizable donation or even not such a sizable donation but it could help with their taxes they can they can definitely write that off. They can have a, it's a tax deductible donation yes. Wonderful and so it sounds like the fundraisers are a really great way too for people just to learn more about Helping Hands Against Violence. They are. Okay most importantly if somebody sees this that is in a situation right now that they know they've got to get out of and they don't know where to turn the best thing for them to do would be call the hotline okay call 911 if you're in this incident and call our hotline if you um, if you need to talk to somebody right away okay all right well Dina thank you so much yeah, for coming thank you. on it's a pleasure meeting you yeah. and appreciate your work yeah, and thank um, you. hopefully we get a really good, or you guys get a really good response and have a very successful fundraiser coming we hope up. So. And uh, really, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that things like this have to exist in society, but uh, they do, and it's great that you guys are there uh, leading the charge. Thank so, you. All right, thank you. And you guys, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time right here on Local Light. John Compton here saying thanks again for watching. And remember, if you've got a guest idea, let us know. Just visit localite.com.